My name is Carla Coppell, and I'm the uh, Vice President of the Center for Applied Conflict Transformation with the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, U.S. Institute of Peace, I hope since most of you are here know, but we are an independent, nonpartisan, congressionally mandated national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, practical, and cost effective. I have to admit that I'm incredibly excited about the conversation this morning because um, First of all, I know most of the individuals on the dais really well, and they're an incredibly smart, capable group of folks. Um, but also because one of the things that we really focus on uh, at USIP is how we bring together different communities to engage in thoughtful dialogue and conversation that doesn't happen elsewhere on a regular basis. Uh, and this is the kind of conversation uh, that I'm talking about. I've watched in my career uh, an incredible evolution in how uh, the development, diplomatic, and defense communities work together along with civil society in a variety of settings around the world. And the, the variation in terms of that collaboration and coordination is extraordinary. Um, from the wonderful work that is done in partnership in uh, providing humanitarian relief and where they've been working together over long periods of time, uh, the coordination and collaboration that has been in, was enhanced through the unfortunate experience of engagements in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, but has grown those relationships. Uh, and then the sometimes odd comments I've heard uh, from unnamed people that uh, NGOs should just get out of the way and allow space for others to do their work. Um, that's a pretty widespread. Uh, and so I think what it points out is the wide range of views that exist, if we're being really honest, uh, and the many questions that arise and how all of these essential pieces of the puzzle can come together uh, in making sure that we are advancing U.S. foreign policy and delivering for the people that we're working with in uh, conflict and crisis-affected states around the world. USIP has been working on this in a number of ways, and I offer this not as an advertisement, although hopefully it is, um, but more to give you a sense of the kinds of work that we're engaged in in really trying to build these bridges and enable this coordination. Um, you will have seen there are three case studies outside uh, that are released this morning. Uh, around the 3D coordination. I'm going to use your copies, Monica, just to please, um, so folks can see these three, which were really about how the 3Ds came together uh, in the Lake Chad Basin, in Burma, and in Jordan, and what worked and what didn't, and how we can learn lessons of those recent experiences to improve that coordination and collaboration moving forward. That's part of a concerted effort to think this through in an evidence-based and uh, historic perspective. We have a tremendous collaborative effort with the J7 uh, around interorganizational tabletop exercises. Some of you and some of the folks on the stage participate and lead those, uh, really around how the defense development, development and diplomatic and non-governmental communities can come, to, come together to learn and to think about the best next steps within specific areas of the world and around specific challenges, most recently related to Somalia uh, and the challenge of transformation, stabilization, and addressing violent extremism. Uh, we look forward to continuing those relationships. They are always undertaken in, in partnership with the combatant command. Um, we've done work with ICRC represented on the panel this morning in their efforts that they're spearheading around humanitarian negotiations and how to really professionalize that and ensure improved coordination and collaboration. Um, and we're working with the um, CT Bureau and others around the issue of foreign fighters and de-radicalization, which was something that actually emerged from an interorganizational tabletop exercise as a critical component of how we chart a path forward as we defeat ISIS and other, um, other violent extremist groups. So there are lots of intersections, lots of programs to draw on, lessons to be learned, uh, challenges to face, and questions to debate. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, Michael Shipler, um, who is one of the other chairs of the Conflict Prevention Resolution Forum, to lead the conversation this morning uh, on behalf of USIP, Search for Common Ground Alliance for Peace Building. Michael, take it away, Michael. Fantastic. Thank you, Carla. Thank you for setting that up. You've done half my job already. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a really uh, important and critical conversation, and welcome to the CPRF. 
Uh, we have a, a really quite distinguished uh, and highly experienced panel of people here. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off just by introducing them. I'm not going to go through their whole bios. Uh, I think the bios were available outside, so you can see the, the vast wealth of experience all over the world that this group of people has. Uh, but I will just introduce them briefly. So on our far left, we have here Jim Shear. Uh, Jim is a senior political scientist at RAND Corporation. Uh, has enormous experience uh, all over the world uh, in, in this exact area and has been focusing uh, his studies on civilian military cooperation. We have Alina Romanowski, who is currently the acting principal deputy coordinator for counterterrorism at the U.S. Department of State, uh, also having served in a host of different roles across the U.S. government. Uh, Bob Schmidt uh, is the acting director for civilian and military cooperation in DACA at USAID. Uh, Stefan Bonami is the Deputy Regional Head of Delegation at the ICRC. Uh, and Monica Shepard is the Vice Director for, for Joint Force Development at the Joint Staff. So welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to do this not as a traditional kind of set of presentations followed by questions, but rather really aiming to do this as almost talk show style. Uh, and we want to create some real opportunities for the audience uh, members who probably bring enormous amount of experience yourselves to interact with our panelists, ask some questions, some probing questions as well. Um, and so we're going to start off with just some questions. The panel will come to the audience. I'll ask some more questions. You even may ask questions of one another if you would like. Uh, and, and that's how it will go. And we will, we will go for about an hour and 20 minutes from now. Jim, I'd like to start off with you. Um, you've been studying this question for quite some time uh, of the importance of civilian military cooperation around all different kinds of areas, different theaters. I wonder if you could talk about why this is important and why this is still such an important topic to be grappling with. Well, Michael, first of all, thank you very much. Thanks to our USIP hosts and to the uh, uh, CPRF uh, coalition for uh, being a sponsor here. It's a great opportunity, and it is a continuing issue of great concern. Uh, I have seen the dynamics here play out uh, over the years, uh, and uh, thinking back to uh, uh, critical moments in, in our post-Cold War history uh, where civil-military relations are absolutely key. And I'll always cite the uh, work of uh, a small cohort <clears throat> here in Foggy Bottom. I called them combat ambassadors. Uh, one of them was the, uh, the late uh, Robert Oakley, who's a good, great friend and mentor. And uh, Bob is actually on the shores of Mogadishu as the Marines were coming in in 91. And he, he actually waved off the warlords and said, don't shoot at the Marines. They're coming here to help. And, uh, and there was actually a very successful humanitarian relief operation initially uh, there. It, it uh, morphed into something much more difficult and challenging, uh, Black Hawk Down, later on. But uh, it was a an epiphanal moment in civil military relations, I have to say. Um, broadly, I, I'd say why it's important, or why is it currently important? Well, we're still living through the uh, era of post-OIF, OEF fatigue with large scale uh, stability operations. Um, and that is totally understandable. I understand why there's a lot of fatigue about that, and given uh, the legacy issues and things we may not have anticipated. Um, I tend to think, by the way, wars can be of choice or necessity, as, as a lot of you already know. Um, I actually think whenever there's a war, whether, whether it's choice or necessity, the stability ops are an operation of necessity. They're a follow-on piece that has to be there. There's a lot of crafting that has to be done right. But uh, it's, it's tremendously important and challenging. And why is it relevant? Well, I will quote uh, uh, Secretary Bob Gates uh, back in 2011, his speech at West Point. He said, when it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagement, since Vietnam, our record is perfect. We have never gotten it right once. Zero. It's perfect. From Guatemala. Panama, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, we never had any idea a year in advance 
that we would be there. In 1989, we weren't learning Serbo-Croatian, right? In 2000, we weren't learning Darian Pashtu. Um, so I tend to view stabilization missions as, right now, very low probability events, but if they happen, sudden onset and high impact events, they, have those, they will have those attributes. So we just can't ignore the reality of stability operations. Um, that said, we have to look hard at the, at the lessons, and we can talk more about that in, in the give and take. So that's just my two cents starting off. All right, excellent. Uh, Bob, I would like to come to you. Sorry, I'm not going to go in order of the panel, so uh, I'd like to come to you, Bob. Um, from USAID, within the USAID development space, uh, what are the most significant challenges that you face when seeking to collaborate with, uh, with the US military? Thanks for that, Michael. Um, so I guess I would, I would echo what Carla said right up front. It's very, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's, a, it's uh, a wide spectrum of how people in the agency view the relationship with AID. Uh, but I'd also go to what Carla said and, and talk about evolution, right? We're, we're, we're still in changing times. So in AID, I still have a lot of colleagues in the building um, who have either made full careers or have had mentors who did full careers without really engaging the military in the field. Um, and that's changing. But, it's, but it is new and it is evolving. So if you look in the Office of Civilian Military Cooperation, I think we're about 12 years old now. So we're still learning. So, so I think that's our, our biggest challenge is um, getting a, a complete understanding of what it is, what the opportunities are, and then how to do it, how to do this civilian military cooperation. How do we, how do we better understand what DOD is all about? And again, it's a big agency out there. So, so how do we inform people? Um, because I think a critical first step is that understanding of each other's culture, each other's organizations, each other's interests, um, and each other's objectives when we get into these stabilization sorts of activities. Because it's important that we stay true to what we do. We in AID will stay true to, to our, our, our development core. Um, but that very neatly aligns in stabilization environments or unstable environments, very neatly aligns with, with the DOD community. Um, Objectives may be a little bit different, but they're not, they're not at odds with each other. So then given that, what DOD wants to achieve and can achieve, what we as an agency want to achieve and can achieve, uh, we need to think creatively, understand how we can bring these two things together and, and really make best use of our, our, our resources in this, uh, just as Jim said, this incredibly important environment that we're working in. All right, excellent, thank you. I'd like to come to you then, Monica. From within the Department of Defense, as you look at the civilian agencies uh, with whom you're collaborating on the ground, what are some of the challenges that, uh, that our military faces when engaging with civilian agencies? Uh, thank you. I, I'd like to approach this from a very practical perspective. Um, we need uh, mechanisms uh, to help develop and train our officers uh, and our, our government civilians to understand that there is no such thing as a single organization called the interagency. Each organization is different. Each organization has its own objectives. Likewise, there is no such thing as a single organization called the non-governmental organization, although some would argue that the ICRC um, is, is close uh, to being this very large uh, group. Um, so, so the first thing is education, in understanding that uh, civilian agencies have their own missions, as Bob said. They have their own priorities. They have uh, a role and a focus that um, is uh, extremely important to the stabilization uh, of the mission set, and that non-governmental organizations are individual, they have their missions, they have their um, uh, framework uh, in which they will be able to work within a certain area and what their red lines are. Because every single organization has its red lines. And many times it's 
it's as important to know what they can't do as what they can do. So, so my challenge, frankly, is preparing um, joint task force commanders and military leaders at all levels uh, to be able to operate in that world, to create a framework where they are able to uh, learn those things and understand them, uh, and to develop an, uh, an understanding. That's the first thing. The second thing is finding a way to create the relationships. I, I think both Jim Shear and, and, and Rob Schmidt, um, both of them have, have really accurately described that we are at a point in our history, evolutionary, where this relationship is developing in, in, in very important ways, but our, our processes that each of us uses to accomplish our mission, they are different. And the way that we bridge those gaps is uh, through relationships, whether it's on the ground or here in Washington or wherever it happens to be. So, so within the Department of Defense, figuring out how to create systems that allow us to develop those relationships that allow them to be sustained over time when our military leadership is changing every two or three years, um, and, and doing that in a constructive way. Um, th those, those are my two big ones, understanding and then creating the, the, the framework for the relationships that's sustainable. Excellent, thank you. Alina, coming to you, you and drawing on your, your diverse experience in the across USG. I wonder if you could speak to the specific benefits or the results from an effective civilian military cooperation. Um, the results. I think the results are still out there, but I think it, it really depends in many ways uh, on how a specific um, uh, effort has achieved or overcome a lot of what I think my colleagues have been saying in terms of the uh, the challenges, and I say that, and I want to go back to what um, Carla said in her introduction, which is there's been a huge, huge progress in, um, I think, helping to change the culture and the way in which um, the military and the civilian agencies, and I say civil, and I include the NGO community because I'll tell you, as someone who started in the intelligence community and then ended up at AID and back at the State Department, bringing the NGOs in on the conversation about how do we stabilize a, a conflict zone or how do we work together in a conflict zone and how do we accept each other. I mean, it's light years now than it was back in the early 80s. I mean, we have to acknowledge that there's been a lot of stovepiping and a lot of cultural shifts um, made. And that has been, and that has, I think, resulted in the fact that we, when you get on the ground, you have a very different way of people interacting in many ways than you do than, than back here in Washington, where we're still living in these stovepipes, despite the fact that our political leadership, and I'm not being political in this context at all, says we got to do this as a whole of, whole of government approach. Um, so I think we, we have a long, we still have a lot of, of work to do in terms of working on those cultural uh, changes, and I think we, I think we'll, we'll be able to talk a little bit about how you go about doing it. I think uh, Monica started to talk about, um, first of all, you know, how do you, how do you within your own organization uh, get people, give people the experience of working together across um, uh, a lines of effort? How do you learn to respect each other's mission and understand each other without saying, I do it better? Uh, or I'm bigger, or I have more money, or I have this, or I have that, or you know I'm impatient because you can't get this done fast enough. We, all of that, you know, that may be anecdotal, but it really comes to the cultural way in which we interact. So that we continue to try to break that down. I think the re because we have now for the last, my math is probably pretty bad right now, but maybe. 15, 20 years, we've been literally in conflict areas together with our NGO community, the humanitarian assistance alongside the, the military, and I'm looking at this also from the CT perspective. Um, um, we have, um, uh, you know, we probably have mixed results, but I, at the end, if I have to say, to bring my own judgment, it's more positive than it was negative. It's always, we can always improve it. Um, 
we are doing more on tabletop exercises. We are doing more on um, integrating civilian and military aspects of the mission into f real exercises that DOD is doing that's critical. We are finding ways, especially in the CT community, on how we, um, we turn this entire effort in longer term into law enforcement, which means that you've got to get the military and the law enforcement community to work together and civilian side of the government. Um, we have a long way to go, but I would say on, on balance, we're doing a better job than we did 10, 20 years ago. And I, we, I can add more as, as we go on in this conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Stefan, coming to you, you know, I wonder if you could speak about, uh, from the ICRC's experience, how you navigate the fundamental principle of neutrality and the way in which you uh, balance that with collaboration or engagement with military forces on the ground? It's a good question. Um, so I might be the decent voice in the room, not only because I speak French, but also because obviously the ICRC, uh, let's say, uh, is in a different framework. Um, well, just to, to say up front, the ICRC was founded actually by, by, by militaries, you know, Swiss militaries who were getting out of a civil war uh, in Switzerland, so they know what they were speaking about. So the ICRC has really a long tradition uh, to, to cooperate and coordinate with, with the military. It's also part of our mandate to, uh, to, uh, to talk and, and act and, and be in, uh, in, in, in cooperation with, uh, with, with military and armed carriers. <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, and, and your question is, I think, is fundamental to understand uh, the framework in which the ICRC uh, stands uh, when it interacts with armed carriers, wherever they are, whatever affiliation they are, they have, and, and, and uh, wherever they, they, they are working. Um, I think that what we need to understand is the different objective. Um, City and armed forces, they have an objective which is to bring peace and stability in countries which are affected by war. That's not at all the objective of the ICRC. We are there to protect dignity and to uh, save lives. So we're not there to, uh, to uh, bring peace and contribute or let's say bring, bring stability to a country. And that's very different in the sense that for us it's extremely important then to gain access to the people we tend to protect and that people we tend to uh, try to to, to save, and when I say, uh, when I mention people we try to protect, I'm, I'm uh, talking about detainees, for instance, and, and civilian population which are under the control of armed groups or uh, or armies, uh, which sometimes are qualified as uh, terrorist groups such as Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS, Boko Haram, uh, FARC. Uh, used to be the military side of the FARC, not the, the political party anymore. Uh, but that's a good example. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's something where we need definitely to keep a neutral stance in order to gain to gain acceptance. So neutrality is not really uh, isolate. It's not a tool to isolate ourselves from a space that we share uh, with with militaries and armed groups. It's a, it's a space that. Uh, that actually draw in the sand the red lines uh, in the cooperation we can have with militaries and, uh, and armed groups. And there are many, and we can talk about that later, I'm sure, but there are many, many places where we do uh, coordinate, cooperate, and you mentioned training, for instance, uh, with, with militaries, especially the U.S. one. Excellent. I, I, and I would just say, you know, I think a lot of the international NGOs who are operating in these kind of environments at least strive to maintain uh, their own principles of impartiality. My organization, Search for Common Ground, has sacrosanct the principle of impartiality. And yet we're taking USAID funding and funding from other donors who are involved in, uh, in, in you know, whole government efforts of stabilization. And so I wanted to, to pick up on this question of red lines. Uh, because I think you, you know you're pointing very clearly to you have a distinct objective from the objective of the militaries with whom you're engaging, uh, as do we and and most of the other international NGOs and in many in many contexts I imagine uh, that's true about USAID. So Bob, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this red line question and what those red lines might be for the development agency. Yeah. So I think I I, I wanted to come back to this. I think red lines are okay. We, we talk about them often 
uh, with a negative connotation. I, I, I think we need to be clear-minded that red lines are okay. We AID will stay true to our, our development core. We will do development activities. We'll follow USG foreign policy and we'll, we'll implement as, as policy dictates. Um, but at, at the base of it, we will do what, what we do and what we do best. We won't do things because the military wants us to in the civ mill space. We talk a lot about, uh, in the Dacia Bureau a lot, we don't do civ mill cooperation for the sake of doing civ mill cooperation. We do civ mill cooperation to achieve better development outcomes to advance U.S. foreign policy interests, to um, carry out the, the, the policy guidance that's given to us. Um, so, so we would be very clear-minded in that. Um, and, you know, we take it up sort of to the strategic level, then what, what do we do um, at the policymaking level? And I'd, I'd take a term from the, from the Joint Staff where the chairman provides his best military guidance. We as an agency at AID have to provide our best development guidance. Um, and, and there's there's a whole um, uh, sausage making process on how, how we get to policy. We need to be very clear and very vocal as an agency about second and third order effects of any sort of military activities. Sometimes policy will dictate that they're going to happen um, regardless of what we say. What, what's important is that we have our voice heard. Policymakers are able to make decisions. Uh, but, but but I would go back to uh, we as an agency strive to achieve our best development outcomes. Uh, we try to advance U.S. national security policies, and, and that red lines are okay. What's important is that we understand what those are, and we don't go forward um, setting bad expectations where, um, while we're in st stabilization, stability operations, uh, something stops, something grinds to a halt because we came to a red line. It's important and incumbent upon us to identify those up front early in the planning process in the interagency, if there is such a thing, um, in the interagency process and be very vocal about what those could be. Alina, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I, I have to agree that I, I think red lines are, are very important and I think they're okay to have and they're important to have um, because not everybody should be doing the same thing across the, across the board. And it's really important when you bring the various different agencies to um, uh, and entities to focus on a problem is, is, is what are those red lines and understand them up front. Um, um, there is one uh, red line that I, I think, or at least a framework, maybe it's better of a framework, call it a framework, that I think uh, people often forget when they look at this issue that you're, we're trying to address here, and that is, um, and maybe Monica's in a better place to talk about this, but I deal with it pretty much every day, is the fact that the deci policy decisions and decisions to engage our military are done in the context of international law and the law of armed conflict. And, the, the ability for decisions to be made in that context, and I'm not a lawyer, but the lawyer, the, the legal framework for doing what we do is really important to remember that that for, for us, especially in the counterterrorism um, and the kinetic engagement piece of it, is a very important framework that we have to, that is applied, and we spend a lot of time talking about it and, and thinking about it, and it helps to, to construct what, how we do other parts and how we bring other agencies to, to bear on this, uh, on the problem. Um, and I think sometimes we overlook that that's a really important construct on, on when, when decisions are made in policies or framework. But I do think that red lines are, important. Um, I think that oftentimes there is a huge frustration, as you were saying, that you, you don't, you know, why can't this agency do more on this part and, and the other? But I think that, again, is, a, is an exercise in a conversation of understanding what that agency's mission and why they do it. Um, uh, from the State Department's view, I think we tend to try and pull all of this together, um, and we try to, to un better understand all the different uh, the red lines and the mission, but um, but they are important and um, and but they're okay to have. You don't want everybody doing the same thing and crossing into each other's red lines because they don't have the capability. That's the most important thing. You wouldn't want AID doing what DOD does in a place they don't have the capability. But um, so I think red lines are critical. But understanding them are also important. Great, uh, Monica, and then I'll come to Jim. I'd love to hear from those. Um, Thank you, Anne, for bringing up 
um, the decision to use military uh, to use the military to accomplish an objective is not made by the military. It's made by our political leaders. And all of us in the department, all of us in federal service, um, swear that we'll preserve and protect, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So all military actions are, are under the leadership and at the direction of uh, civilian leadership. So, so thank you for bringing that up. I, I take it so much for granted uh, that, that having the opportunity to remind myself and to speak about it is, is important, so thank you for that. Um, I think red lines uh, are not just okay, they are absolutely critical. Um, I believe that each organization is most effective at their mission when those red lines are clear, when they are articulated, and when organizations act consistently with their red lines. Because it creates among, for, for non-governmental organizations or charities, it creates confidence among the donor base so that those organizations continue to do their work. For USAID, it creates a constancy and a framework where they can continue to do their work. So, so I'm, I'm I'm rabidly supportive of red lines. Um, I think what is important within the Department of Defense is it is helpful for, to, for us to understand those red lines up front. And it is extremely important that, that when there are red lines, they are articulated clearly and sufficiently so that understanding is generated. Too often, the conversation about red lines um, occurs and people talk past each other. So for those of you who are working in the field, for DOD, when you're dealing with DOD personnel, it's sometimes helpful for you to use in articulating your, your red lines to use some scenarios or use some what ifs or intellectual exercises to describe it so that we don't end up talking past each other. DOD wants uh, charities and non-governmental organizations in the field to be successful because, quite frankly, the mission that, you, that, that those organizations perform is not DOD's mission. We want USAID to be fully successful in the field because the mission that they perform is not the military mission, nor should it be. So, so red lines are absolutely critically important to the Department of Defense. Staying true to your objectives and to your donor bases for charities and non-governmental organizations is absolutely critical for the success, not only of that organization, but also of DOD. And being able to communicate clearly and unambiguously so that we're not talking past each other is really very helpful. And the big successes have been when we've been able to do that. Excellent. Uh, to uh, absolutely agree that red lines are, are a key challenge and uh, oftentimes helpful, uh, even though sometimes they can be rigidly drawn and then flexibly implemented, which is an issue that I ran into a lot on things like non-combatant evacuations. When do we go to authorized departure when the rebels are 50 clicks out from the capital city? When do we go to order departure when they're five clicks out, and when do we fly in to uh, do evacuations of U.S. and third country nationals? A big challenge. Uh, rule number one on the red lines, understand DOD lawyers really well, okay? Because they will say, and picking up Monica's point, DOD is not a development agency. You cannot build back better, to cite a former presidential quote. Uh, civic assistance does not mean you build up new stuff. You can repair stuff, uh, but if you get into that, then you then you break the second red line, uh, which I often have seen, and that is no mission creep, please. Uh, and you can sometimes get in humanitarian deployments where. The military is kind of sort of like with the AID. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is, let's leave while we're still liked and before we are asked. But there may be folks over here in Foggy Bottom who say, well, but your presence has a certain calming effect. It provides ambient security. Well, 
that's mission creep. So that can be an issue too. That's why we have something called the mission tasking matrix, the MITAMs, which we developed, uh, actually Pacific Command developed it first, but it's used in the Haiti earthquake response, where we're actually tracking specific requests for military tasking to, to do stuff. And when there wasn't much on the spreadsheet, and most of the uniforms were, you know, working their smartphones in the tents and not doing anything, time to leave, right? Well, that was an issue. Uh, we worked through it. We got through it. It was fine. But there were some tensions there. So uh, I, yeah, I would agree broadly red lines are important. And fundamentally, an agreed division of labor. If we're going in in a civ mill presence, who's doing what? Typically on an HA mission, humanitarian mission, it's DOD logisticians, they do the wholesale delivery, and the civilians and the NGOs do the retail distribution. That's a, that's a pretty good division of labor. You get the stuff to the airports or through the seaports, and then it goes into distribution. Now, there have been problems sometimes with that, but it's broadly that's a constructive division of labor, which you can use across the mission set. Now, Bob, let me ask you, you know, for, for the NGOs who are getting funding from USAID in a stability environment, how do they navigate with you, the, their red lines and their principles of impartiality, whether they're delivering humanitarian assistance, democracy development assistance, uh, and what kind of costs do they face if they draw a clear red line around their own impartiality? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a great question. That's a, that's a tough nut to crack. Um, so I guess, right, again, um, I think the NGO community, just like AID has to be true to our core values, I think the NGO community does as well uh, and, and needs to understand as, as we're, we're writing um, grants or agreements sort of what, what those things are. And I think the most important piece is the communication up front of what it's going to be. That we avoid mission creep, but, but very clear-minded, in the in the in, in initial discussions about what can and can't take place, what we may or may not be able to do, um, we would we would always strive to serve as as a buffer between the military and our implementing partners. It's, it's even in our our um, our policy with on cooperation with Department of Defense that we would serve as that interlocutor. Uh, we would help translate. We would help one organization understand the other. Um, but, but I think the most important piece is, and, 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 and the price that's paid, is, 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 is the scope of what can be done. But it has to come up front, manage expectations, clear-minded, what's in the realm of the possible, um, and then stick with it. Excellent. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to, I don't know if you're moving on to another topic, but I did well, just want to, you, you yeah. Not, yet, I, not. not quite. I, on red lines, I think also, um, uh, defining red lines is something that's going to be really important as we bring in new partners into um, and new voices and and to solving these um, some of the stabilization and the return to some normalcy in some countries and I'm, I'm referring largely to the work that I think we're all beginning to grapple with on the you know de-radicalization and the reintegration of of uh, of uh, foreign terrorist fighters and their families. Um, this is a community um, uh, of largely, um, you know, border security and law enforcement, and all of a sudden we're turning around and realizing, oh, wait a minute, we've forgotten the social services folks. We've forgotten the child psychologists, the psychiatrists, the those who are trained in how do you deal with de-radicalizing or changing someone's mindset. And, and, and it's interesting to listen to those people who are, you know, in that community that is going to become being asked to participate in conversations about how we do things on the ground. And I think we're going to have to, again, it's one thing to come to the table and define your, we your red lines on that as institutions, but we're also going to have to find sort of what what that community's red lines are, and then maybe our red lines begin to shift. So while we're all sitting here saying they're really great and red line always sounds very definitive and we can define them clearly, in some places where you're trying to build a larger community to solve a problem, you may end up shifting your red line a little bit. So I leave that as kind of out there. I don't know the answer, but I know we're going to be <laughs> looking at it. Excellent. One of the challenges of this conversation, uh, and I think of the whole exercise, 
is that we're talking about a really wide range of contexts. Um, you know, Burma. I mean, even the three the three contexts that that uh, the reports are issued on. You know, Burma is a, an environment where you have, on one hand, a, a trans a reform effort, democratization effort going on, and a peace process trying to bring an armed conflict to an end. While you also have uh, very striking levels of violence in other parts of the country that are not actually being tackled by a peace process. But one awfully different context from Afghanistan, where you have ongoing hostilities in which. U.S. forces are directly engaged. Uh, you brought up, you know, the the, the operations uh, after the earthquake in Haiti. That's also a very different kind of context. And so the red lines in those environments may also have to be a little bit different and defined. I think this is very important, though, to put forward very clearly that there is space to identify, articulate those red lines and processes that are relationship oriented, but also institutionalized. It seems for people to actually share those red lines. And I, I would just add as an NGO practitioner, it becomes something that, you know, if, if you talk to NGOs, it becomes something that feels like a very high cost conversation with USAID uh, or with other donor institutions to say, well, we're gonna put this red line around to information sharing. We're gonna access insight into the dynamics in this community where foreign fighters are reintegrating, uh, but we can't actually share that information up. How do we, you know, and, and that seems like a highly costly potential red line if we're going to be working with, you know, the Counterterrorism Bureau of the State Department, for instance. Um, yes, please. And then we'll um, go to the audience. I'd like to, to follow up um, on this point. Um, in addition to the red lines that we have institutionally and organizationally, there are also red lines or limitations that have been created by legislation uh, in the various countries. So, for instance, we may know that uh, reintegration and stabilization should occur in a particular area, yet there's a legal restriction on NGOs being able to operate with that particular group for, for any number of reasons. So in addition to the institutional and organizational red lines, you know, the current limitations legislatively on NGOs being able to operate or USAID being able to operate with an organization that may have some elements that have been com identified from a terrorism perspective also creates its own, own limitations. You, you may collectively, we may get together and know that reintegration of the individuals requires us to do something and yet the organization that's best qualified to do that, the non-governmental organization that's best qualified to do it, is not able to engage. This is a big issue in our community. Elena, and I'd love to hear you comment on this as well, Stephanie. No. Let's start with you, Elena. Yeah, I was just going to add to that briefly that, um, and in fact, uh, we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years through the multilateral uh, uh, and international organizations to figure out the the law uh, to help countries figure out how to change their own domestic laws to address um, uh, the terrorism issues in terms of prosecution. How do you, you know, what do you, you how do you protect um, privacy laws? Uh, we all have different views of that in the international community. The EU is a collective, the individual countries and others. But it, but to uh, Monica's point, you know, part of getting the group together and having these conversations and figure out how do you address um, a situation has resulted in many countries changing their um, their laws to be able to accommodate, uh, uh, you know, what is sometimes perceived as a red line or an inability to do something. Um, we have our own authorities, even within government agencies, that we're even looking at how do we change those so that we can do things that we realize that we should be doing, either as an agency or as a as a whole of government approach, because people actually do have the resources or the mission to do it. They just don't have the authorities to do it. So, <laughs> Stefan, would you like to comment on this? Well, it, it's more of a general comment, and I was happy that you mentioned, Alina, the, uh, the international humanitarian law as a, as a framework, which is not a framework for international organization or humanitarian organization. It's a framework, first and foremost, for state and parties to the conflict, which may be non-state actors as well. And uh, they are the first one to be uh, concerned by, by, by impartiality, uh, which is the most, let's say, 
pr prominent red lines that you may find when you try to uh, to implement uh, humanitarian action. And we, we must understand as well that organization uh, act only as a substitute when the states or the parties to the conflict uh, cannot anymore ensure impartiality. And that means something when we talk about red lines. That means uh, that for an organization like the ICRC, when we are called in because parties to the conflict cannot ensure the principle of, which is a legal requirement, the principle of, of, of impartiality, uh, we must do all efforts to uh, create an environment for us uh, which is conducive to, to, to have access to all uh, territories, all parties, all places of detention. And that means, of, in terms of perception, that means in terms of red line, that means uh, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, uh, try not uh, to, to, uh, to, to be caught into decision, action whatsoever that could affect this perception by the Al-Shabaab in Somalia, or by, by Al-Qaeda in, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, or by Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. And that's the only way for us, because we don't use armed escort, uh, that's the only way for us, according to the modus operandi that we have, to access those people. Uh, and so I actually have a question for Stefan. Uh, <clears throat> the humanitarian space issue uh, is often described as a civ mill conundrum, and that sort of close association with the military is sort of uh, encroaches on impartiality. What about differences within the civilian NGO community? You have humanitarian organizations, impartiality is key, but human rights advocacy groups do naming and shaming, right? They, they do, and that's their mission, you know, to, to point to, to bad behavior that, that violates humanitarian standards. So how do you work that internally within the civilian community? I mean, there, there are tribal aspects on the civilian side and on the military side, and uh, we're not all tree huggers or knuckle draggers, right? But uh, there are differences. So if you could describe the civilians, that would be interesting, helpful. Yes, thank you. Well, first and foremost, there is no, I mean, the notion of space, uh, humanitarian space, there is no such physical space, there is, it's a symbol. We all share the same space, so all actors, NGOs, human rights, uh, international organization, armed actors, political authorities, we're all in the same space. So they, as a de facto, we have to interact. Uh, but nevertheless, you have two extremes. You have uh, the, the, the Isola isolationism, no, how do you say that? <laughs> that you understand it? Yes. yes. Uh, on one side, and, and you have on the other side, you have prosalitism when it, when it comes to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, principles, the framework of human action. We in the ICRC, we, we are on uh, neither uh, both sides. We are not an isolationist organization, nor a proselytism, proselytist organization that would promote for all organizations uh, the need to respect uh, uh, independence, neutrality, uh, and uh, humanity somehow. Uh, humanity, I hope, but whatever. Uh, we are in the middle. We are much more uh, ecumenist. You say that, yeah, ecumenist, in the sense that uh, we accept that other organizations have different principles. But when it comes to humanitarian action, there is one that must be, uh, must be respected because it's a legal requirement. It's not something that, is, that has been invented by the ICRC uh, some years ago or uh, whatever. It's a legal requirement which is in, uh, in the law, and this is impartiality. And that concerns all actors that share the space. So we have no problem with human rights organization uh, blaming and shaming, and we have no problem at all with other organization being embedded with counterterrorism uh, actors or with, 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 with military actions. Uh, we have chosen a different path, which is uh, the path of acceptance, uh, which is the path of uh, neutrality to ensure that acceptance. Uh, what uh, or, or, modus, or modus operandi, we see, we see it as complementary in the sense that uh, for us sometimes it's good uh, to have uh, human rights organization blaming and shaming uh, on things that we see every day uh, but uh, uh, upon which we have to remain silent because still we need to access uh, the Kurdish places of detention uh, or the, 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 the Boko Haram territory and we, we must shut our mouth. And, and sometimes we're very happy that others uh, take the lead and, and, and voice out. So it's complementary. 
Yes, please. And within, within the Department of Defense, it's important that we recognize everyone's equity. Within the Department of Defense, our objectives are to accomplish the military objectives established by the political leaders. And we do that using a whole host of tools, including weapons. So, so each of the <coughs> organizations represented here and in the audience, I think it's really important that everybody recognizes that what Stefan, the point he's making, that we are in the same space, that we have uh, very uh, different tools that are at our disposal to accomplish our objectives, and that we are able to communicate those very clearly um, and have the conversation openly it does not mean that we need to diminish, 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 I'm sorry, you're better with English than I am, Dim, diminish each other or uh, vilify each other. It is important that we understand the various roles and that if with, within the Department of Defense, in order to accomplish our military objective, we have to train people to be able to be effective, to use weapons and to, when necessary, uh, kill people, um, that that is part of the mission um, and, and that that um, is controlled by the civilian leaders of the government. Just to, to, to illustrate what Monica says, we have here in Washington, we have uh, two delegates, ICRC delegates, who are called FAS delegate, which is in French, Force Armée uh, Service, Armed Forces Services. And they do travel around, they go to Tampa, they go to uh, Fort Bragg, uh, and they go to all those places where you have uh, special operations forces or uh, armed forces which are going to be deployed to the field, uh, deployed to Iraq uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, and to other theater of operations, and uh, we talk to them. So those two delegates, they go and talk to them. They participate to exercises where they play the role of the ICRC uh, because the military are going to uh, to, 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 to have to interact with the ICRC in the field, be it for detention issues, be it for uh, protection issues. When I say protection, in respect of the law, when they do strike uh, uh, military target. Uh, so we speak to them, we, we tell them, well, look, you're going to see the ICRC, Big Red Cross. Or, uh, so uh, first, we're not a target. Second, uh, you have law to respect. And, and, and third, uh, we're not uh, tree, uh, tree hunger. We're there to, uh, to support you in making sure that you respect the law, uh, and, and, but we have, you have to respect certain red lines when it comes to interacting with us. So you're not asking for military intelligence. We're not going to, uh, uh, to be embedded with you whatsoever. So there is a dialogue, and, and it's a very solid and robust dialogue uh, with uh, the U.S. military forces, which is some, somehow, and I'm finished, uh, somehow a challenge with other groups uh, with which we have difficulties to interact, uh, obviously. And my sense is that this is vastly more developed between the ICRC and the U.S. military and other militaries than it is with the other sectors of the NGO community. Some humanitarian organizations are able to really effectively manage those relationships, but the peacebuilding community, for instance, uh, of which the, this, this forum uh, represents, this is a much more substantial struggle with a lot more gray, fuzzy area. I want to open it up now to, to, the, uh, to the audience for, for any questions that you may have. Uh, if you could just say your name uh, and affiliation, not, not a whole uh, background. And my colleague here is going to have a microphone, so she is going to, she is going to go around. And really, we'll, let's take questions uh, as if you were calling into a talk show and not speeches, please. So we have a, a friend in the back, please. And I will ask your permission ahead of time to cut you off if you start into a speech, and that is done with the utmost of respect for the vast experience that you surely are bringing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a pr I'm president of an organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts and violence. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and I'm from Kenya initially. Uh, you say it is, it's just a comment. I had talked about what we are talking about, the former um, uh, general of uh, AFRICOM. I said, AFRICOM, now that you are in Africa, how can you collaborate with civilians? 
civilians on the ground know a lot of things. We just need coordination, collaboration, and uh, working with them. How can we work? I never got that answer until we are speaking here now. Excellent. Civilians, NGOs are the best people because they know a lot on the ground. Thank you. Terrorism, anything that we can say. So how do we work together with you, living alone, cursing or saying who is doing what? Because the small non-profits do a lot, especially the CPOs on the ground. But they don't have the capability, financial capability. But because the TOT or the military has the capability, let's work together. Let's train them, work together, share the money, and the work will be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a really critical question. We've been talking about how the ICRC interfaces with the you know, U.S. military and, and, and Fort Bragg uh, and, and some of this very high-level interaction. But really where the most substantial level of challenge exists on the ground. How do you liaise with, connect with that local community-based organization, a local uh, youth association who may be actually doing some of the most important front-line work? I guess I'll volunteer first. <laughs> um, I think that, I think the answer to your question is, um, um, is, is both a complicated and a simple one. On the one hand, um, uh, you have to, it, it goes to the personalities of the people on the ground, uh, first and foremost, which is critical. You have to have people who are willing to reach out, whether they're in uniform or whatever their uniform is. They have to be responsive to the local community. And the other way around is that the, uh, the local community also has to, and there, there there's a little bit of a mixed um, message sometime about the local community wanting to find the right forum to have a conversation with, say, the, the United States military in uniform <laughs> versus the State Department versus USAID. So that becomes a very tactical issue about how you actually, um, you know, do those, uh, those interactions. I will say a couple of things, which I think I, I said um, earlier. I think the ability to actually get uh, across uh, these the communities to bring them together on actual exercises in the community or tabletop exercises or bring them to a um, neutral space like USIP or someplace in the region where you have these uh, conversations and discussions that break down the stovepipes um, so that you begin to that. I think is important. I think the sense that just because the U.S. military has a ton of money and a local NGO doesn't have a lot of money, it doesn't mean, and this is understanding the red lines um, and what the mission is, it doesn't mean that the United States military can all of a sudden turn around and fund a local community. So there is an understanding. But how do you get to that? That is by bringing and having communities uh, come together um, without uh, too much rancor over what you're doing and what you're not, but simply uh, having a conversation in in a, in a probably a neutral and safe space. So I would encourage those on the ground to to do that and to find opportunities. And and again, that goes to you know the personality of people on the ground. Great, Stefan, you want to comment on this? Yes, I um, I think what we have to keep in mind when it comes to the interaction of uh, military with with the civilian community, whatever or however they're organized, uh, in a conflict situation, I'm not talking in a peaceful situation or in a natural disaster, but in a conflict situation, is uh, that the military, whatever the means, have an objective, which is to win the war. So it, they can do it either through uh, enforcement uh, or they can do it uh, through through a winning heart and mind, and that uh, that include humanitarian action uh, in, in this regard. So when they do interact with with with, inter with with the civilians, and I've seen that myself in Afghanistan, I think uh, that there is a there is a framework of action which needs to be respected, which is the do no harm principle, which is, which is dear to humanitarian humanitarian organization, which means essentially uh, whatever the action you're going to do, try to assess the risk not for you, but try to assess the risk and consequences for the civilian population. And I've seen myself when I was in Afghanistan in 2004-2005, uh, the, the PRTs, you know, the Provincial Reconstruction Team, that were going into, uh, into um, uh, Taliban-held territories and, 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 and bringing you know, schools and teachers, and then they had to get out because they had no military support to, uh, to, uh, to, to make that sustainable. And at the end of the day, you had either a teacher being killed or uh, the schools being destroyed because that was a symbol for the Taliban of, uh, of, of the enemy. Uh, so I think uh, 
it's, it's possible and it's good to engage with, with the community, but uh, that's where uh, humanitarian organization and military could not cooperate, but could exchange on good practices, uh, such as the do no harm principle. Excellent, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, my name is David Smith. I'm with the FORGE Center for Peacebuilding and Humanitarian Education. And we train graduate students and professionals in military in simulation work to, to look at what's going on on the ground. And, and ultimately, the question is what happens on the ground? So looking at training, really, between communities, NGO communities, and military communities, what are the best practices and the best results you've seen in the types of training that can take place? I mean, we're talking at a policy level, but at the end of the day, we're looking at infantrymen, we're looking at junior NGO officers, we're looking at people who are in the field. What can we do before they go to train them best before they work in the field? Monica. Um, it's, uh, that, is, that is part of what um, we are focusing on over the course of the next year. Um, one of the best practices that we've seen is, um, has two parts. The first is some sort of blended learning. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, it is the use of all of the technologies that are available and the assessment of a stream of training. So it might start with uh, an e-learning uh, capability, then uh, maybe some personal dynamics, then exercising those ideas in a framework, then assessing it, and then doing assistance at the end. So it's, it's, it's this five-step process uh, that we have seen that is highly effective. And that has been coupled in several of our, um, m by several of our military leaders requiring a specific kind of training before people arrive in theater. So if a 2,000 person force is going forward and this is required, then 2,000 members would go through that training uh, before they arrive. So that, that has been a, is a best practice. We've seen it in our assessments. We've seen it be highly effective. I had a conversation um, uh, with Carla Koppel earlier today about how we might be able to expand that and how we might be able to take best practices from USIP's uh, case studies or, or frankly from anyone's case studies about best practices and make them available to the entire spectrum of military leaders um, in advance of a, a deployment. So I agree with you completely. Your, your primary assertion, the golden nugget, was that what matters is what happens on the ground. It, and that's how we prepare. In addition, what we're trying to do is set the framework with the very senior military leaders so that strategically they understand that it's important for them to articulate this requirement, for them to establish what the minimum uh, entrance standards are when someone goes into their theater of operation. Um, and uh, I have two members of my staff here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Brett Clark is in the back. Uh, I will tell you that Brett, ha Brett has had experience in theater uh, working with the um, various communities that are represented in theater. And um, if anybody has ideas, we, we would love to explore this further. I would just add also that the need for uh, civilians, particularly in the NGO side, to have training on how to engage with and work with militaries, both state and non-state military actors, is critical. And I, I've had this experience myself. I was in Nepal at the, at the beginning of the peace process there. And you know I, I, there were military advisors from the UN. It wasn't a full UN peacekeeping operation. And at the beginning, I, I literally, we had presence everywhere in the country, Search for Common Ground. I couldn't get them to take me seriously because I didn't have a shared frame of reference or understanding of the core principles that were guiding them or how to relate in an effective way. And, and so the importance for those of us on our civilian side uh, to be able to learn how to engage is, is there. Please, Bob. So if I could speak not so much to the, to the NGO community, but, but for the USG, folks sort of working in this space, some, some things that, that we're doing, uh, some training specifically that, that we're doing that, that I, I think is showing fruitful. Uh, so one, our Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA, has a course called the JHOC, Joint Humanitarian Operations Course, where it's, it's a course for the military 
uh, to help our DOD colleagues sort of understand how OFTA is going to lead the U.S. response and how the military fits into that. Uh, and, and this all goes back to the, just like we started with the biggest challenge is understanding. How do we understand each organization? Uh, so the Jayhawks a, a great opportunity. We from our office provide to, to all civil affairs officers or all civil affairs um, soldiers going through the qualification course at Fort Bragg uh, a one day training on USAID. Um, how we do things, what we do, what our objectives are, how they can interact with us, how we work with our implementing partners. So not, not, it's, not a, it's not about the NGO community, but so they get a better understanding of how AID works and how AID works is through our implementing partners, and that comes out crystal clear. So at least the folks in the civil affairs community are getting that tomorrow. Actually, I'm headed out to PACOM. We're going to do a few iterations of, of this course for, for military planners. Again, if you get it right in the plan, it, it might come out right in, in the execution, or at least would be at a good start point. Um, when civil affairs team rotate, when they're on, out going out to their six month or nine month rotations, uh, by and large, they'll come through USAID and we'll link them up with our, our desk officers and they'll understand kind of what USAID's interests are in country before they, they get on the ground. And again, you know, our, our, if, if they remember nothing else, what we tell them is stop and talk to your USAID mission. Uh, and again, that's going to be, it's not the direct training about uh, the NGO community, but, but it's going to help them start to think, think about that. Um, so, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, Monica, at the very beginning, you brought up this question of how do people formulate relationships with each other, which are meaningful based on mutual respect, mutual collaboration. That's at the center of this exercise, even if it's a soft skill. Let's, let's come over here, sir. Thank you. My name is David Wood. I'm a journalist here in Washington. So one of the conflicts I've seen in conflict zones, conflicts between military and NGOs and, and USAID is over the issue of security. So I wonder if you could address that both from the, from the standpoint of the military, which is to what extent do you want to and can you extend security for people, NGOs working in the field, for example, and journalists, I might add. Um, and from the other side, from the NGO and State Department side, how much security do you want? Okay, Jim. Thanks for the question, and it's a really hard one. Uh, broadly speaking, the array of actors in a conflict zone, military and civilian, don't often have a lot of choices. You could stand out like a sore thumb, you could wear, draw, drive a white vehicle with a blue helmet, and that's how the UN did it for many years as neutral peacekeepers. You could blend in, which is to camouflage, and I saw that vividly in the Balkans when a certain unit driving down Mount Igman in a white vehicle with blue helmets were suddenly fired upon and they started to smudge their vehicle with mud so it would blend in, it would be camouflage. Well. There goes neutrality. It was you know, a partisan actor suddenly. Or you can armor up. And that's really, those are the really the only three options. I think the key issue for working together in a conflict zone is to understand, especially on the, for the military, to understand how the civilians feel they need to accomplish their mission. If there are security concerns, when do those arrive? When does there have to be? Uh, medevacs or evacuation procedures? How are those done? How is information shared broadly? Who's going to be going down to what village or what district tomorrow to do stuff that, that our local military uh, presence needs to know about? So knowledge in advance, I think, is, is, is critical. But it's really a hard problem. Stefan, you mentioned earlier that ICRC does not take armed escorts. And could you talk about why that's so critical? Yes. yes. Uh, but first, let, let me, when we talk about security and, and security for humanitarian organization, uh, it's the same than for civilians. There are obligations. And those obligations are not on, uh, on, 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 on the civilians or on uh, the humanitarian organization. The obligation to protect are uh, on, on the shoulders of 
uh, the armed, uh, the armed, armed uh, carriers. Uh, so it means for us that we, there are obligations, especially for the Red Cross, uh, that we should not be targeted. Uh, so what, and it comes to your questions, uh, what to do when, when, when we are targeted? And we have, unfortunately, the sad, uh, the sad story of, of uh, this week, where we had two staff killed, one in Afghanistan, one in, in, uh, in South Sudan. So what happened for the ICRC when we, are tag when we become a target? Uh, there is the question of armed escort. Should we use armed escorts to go uh, and, 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 and go where we would like to go? There are countries where we use armed escort. In Somalia, we have armed escort. But it's not because of uh, the threats posed by Al-Shabaab or by other groups. It's because of the criminality environment, which has imposed on us the need to have armed escort. But we, we must control them. But this is mostly what the, sole, the sole context, the, 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 single, the sole context where we have armed escort. Um, what, what, is, what is important for us is to keep our independence and to keep our uh, capacity to go where we would like to go according to our own criteria, which means that we have delegated to the field, to the delegate in the field to assess their security environment, and they have to, on the basis of this security environment, they have to come up with uh, uh, strategies how to address uh, those risks and whether, uh, and, and, and with the knowledge that those risks can be addressed, then we go. Uh, they have to accept as well when we are in the field that there is a certain amount of risks uh, that are incompressible. You can die, you can be killed, that's, that's part of the job, I would say. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's how it is. Uh, so, so now, uh, the use of military assets to protect us uh, can, be, can, be, can be as well a strategy from, from the state in place to control our movement. So we have to be careful about that. And armed escort also uh, can infringe our perception of, of, of a neutral organization, and then we may be not uh, well received in Al-Shabaab territories, for instance, if we had the Amisom escorting us. Uh, because, of course, they are fighting against each other. That's the same for Boko Haram territories, or that's the same in Syria when we make cross line, uh, cross line, uh, front line uh, um, uh, crossing. If we are escorted by the Syrian government or the Syrian army, or if we are escorted by some armed groups, then the other side might see us as well, look, guys, you, you're working with them. So that's bad. So that's why the ICRC, as a modus operandi, is trying to, uh, to, to really enforce the, 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 the question of acceptance by armed groups so that we can deal with them about our security guarantees. Yeah. And we can, we can get uh, security guarantees uh, coming. From, so we're not a, a naive organization going in, you know, in the dark and uh, without knowing the environment. The first requirement of any delegate in the field is to know its environment. And it comes with the security environment. And if there is no confidence, uh, good level of confidence that we're not a target, uh, we, go, we don't go. Hmm? It happens sometimes, and that's my last word on this question, it happens sometimes, nevertheless, that in extreme situation, uh, we have to count on, on certain forces uh, to, to evacuate us. This is the last resort. We've, we, the French army, for instance, evacuated the ICRC in the um, Central African Republic uh, uh, two years or three years ago. Uh, because of, of, of what was happening there, and we had no means, we had lost everything. So we had to go uh, with a safe, uh, a safe structure to be evacuated. But it's al always a last resort. So I, I want to turn us to uh, the notion of peace building. So we we've talked a lot here about uh, humanitarian access and humanitarian assistance. But in fact, our, our, our subtitle of this, of this uh, panel is how US agencies and nonprofits can collaborate to reduce violent conflict. And you, un, underneath this, this title, we have the kind of central premise that U.S. agencies, military, civilian agencies, and nonprofits should collaborate to reduce violent conflict. And I want to start with that. Is, does that core premise hold up? Is there actually a joint uh, collaborative opportunity to transform conflict in places like the Lake Chad Basin or in Myanmar? Would you like to start? Sure. 
Well, but for, as I said at the beginning, I mean, for the ICRC, the objective is not that. The, the, the mandate we have is not to, uh, to build up peace and achieve stability. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that what we do does not contribute to it. Uh, if, if, we, if we look at what, hap what happened in Colombia with the FARC, for instance, um, should the ICRC, I mean, the, the FARC was able to, uh, to, uh, to travel to sustain negotiation, political negotiation that has been successful uh, because they were able to go to Cuba, a neutral space, somehow. Uh, but they were able to go to Cuba uh, because the ICRC provided the flight, well, first the car uh, to go and to, uh, to, to, to bring uh, the FARC leadership from uh, the jungle to, uh, to the airport. And in, in, in the airport, they were able to fly with an ICRC plane to Cuba. And we did that uh, in a year 150 times. Yeah. It was under the radar, not seen, uh, but that's the kind of contribution that we can do while still delivering our mandate. Uh, that we can do uh, to 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 uh, to to the peace uh, peace process. When you when you, as an ICRC we, we we engage, for instance, with uh, the, the the U.S. armed forces uh, in in Iraq uh, about Mosul or about about uh, um, in the Ninawa province, um, and we, we we ask them to uh, respect or to make, to put pressure on their partners to respect the law when they do target uh, when they do target military objectives, so that there is no uh, there is no uh, uh, huge collateral damages. It's also contribute to uh, to put a hold a development hold in the sense that it does not damage so so much uh, the public services, which will be then afterwards available uh, for the civilian population. And so they will, they will, they will have a certain level of access to water and whatsoever. So that's useful as well. Uh, when we talk about exchange of prisoners as well, it builds trust between uh, the parties to a conflict, and we contribute as well uh, to that by doing so. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of contribution we have. So, so these are uh, these are excellent specific examples of interventions. And thank you very much for that, Alina. And then I'd like to come to you, Monica. But Alina, you know, I'd love to hear your comments on where the opportunities exist for that collaboration and where we should not be doing pursuing it. Well, <clears throat> I. I think if you if, if the question was really um, how do you go about peace building and is that our mission? I would say that the the that the United States is much more interested in pursuing peace and building peace than encouraging uh, violent conflict. So if that's if that's the statement you're looking for, I mean, obviously we're in there are sure. conflicts in the world and we're all engaged in it. If you're asking the question about how do all of us from different agencies contribute to it, I think. Um, Stefan actually, you know, started that they that the international NGO community has a has an important role to play because in many cases, whether they are a recipient of U.S. Uh, assistance or other international donors, they have a role in stabilizing on on many levels. Um, I think I think the the real issue though is that you know that's a policy formulation. Um, that's what we, at least at the State Department and our interagency colleagues here, are spending an awful lot of time on, which is how do we how do we bring peace and stability to Iraq, to Syria, to Afghanistan, to all of these places where we have um, we have conflict, um, you know, potential even North Korea. So there is a diplomatic engagement backed up by a whole series of development uh, options, of military options. I mean, it's it's sort of as they. You know, you say it's all on the table, but everybody who in our international partners are part of of, uh, of engaging um, to uh, to help de-escalate um, uh, 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 conflict or build peace in certain regions. So I think that's something at least that we're all doing in the international uh, community. I think there there is a role for everybody, uh, especially if you look at conflicts that have been going on a long time in Iraq and Afghanistan. Maybe we're, you know, this is a subject for a lot of another discussion, which you guys do very well also, which is how do you do it in Afghanistan? How do you do it here? Do we have the right policy? Are we putting the right emphasis? But, but I mean, I think that's what we're trying to do. And sometimes you have to lead, um, again, others can debate this, uh, with, um, you know, military engagement. Uh, against the armed actors, and then you, you, at the same time, you're trying to bring in our development uh, 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 resources at the same time. One of the things that we've been experiencing at Search for Common Ground over the last few years is security forces of, of, of all 
from all over the world approaching us uh, asking for support as recognition of in particular contexts where kinetic force is going to be limited in its effectiveness uh, there's a pursuit of other tools or other kinds of partners to engage uh, and we face consistently a question of where is that an appropriate thing to do where is it not where does that engagement uh, compromise our impartiality and where does it actually complement our objectives of building peace in a particular society if I can just add one more component too, I think, which we have tried, uh, I think, as the U.S. government for quite a while, which is to to put the uh, to bring bring the as much of the engagement of the host government and others in a country or a region to um, address the. I hate to tell you, the root causes, drivers, whatever you want to term, whatever term you want to use to describe, you know, what is bringing on this conflict. Our engagement um, is very much to try and, and see if we can do this in partnership with the host government, if there is one or, or other means. So I think that's, that's an important, and we're doing, trying to do more and more of that, which is something we really haven't talked about either. The resources that a host government um, and a local community have to bring those resources together um, and how do you mobilize those? Absolutely. I think the peace building community as a whole is confronting the question of how we step up to this challenge, whether we want to. And I think there's, you know, I mean, Tim, you spoke to the diversity of the NGO uh, space. It's a hugely pluralistic universe. Uh, but I think our community of peace builders are grappling with these questions fundamentally. In some ways, this is the moment we've been building to for 30 years as a field saying, wow, security forces are saying, how do we use peace building tools to actually advance our stabilization and security objectives? And then we want to run into the question of whether we jump through that, whether we actually have the tools yet. Are we really ready to rise that challenge? Monica. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, the peacekeeping community finds itself faced with the same complexity of actors in its space that the military finds itself in, in, in different ways. So just as the military has to deal with the complexity of the challenges, the peacekeeping community has the same level of complexity uh, that it's dealing with now. Um, I would suggest to you that the peacekeeping community uses the military every single day, 24-7, uh, as a framework, uh, as part of the peacekeeping community's tools with regard to deterrence. Um, we often don't think about having a military in any nation as being a way of creating deterrence and sustaining peace, but in fact it is you're much less likely to have critical nation state um, kinds of conflicts or conflicts within countries where you have uh, competent, successful, objective militaries following their, the, the, the rule and, and um, civilian leadership. So, so first of all, we, we use that all the time and we don't often talk about it. Um, keep in mind for the United States and for many militaries, the decision to use uh, a military response is a policy determination that is made by uh, civilian leaders when they determine that that's the best course of action. There's no military leader who wants to send troops into, into a situation that, and, and they won't without the full backing of, of the civilian uh, authorities who, are, who, who sit over them, okay? Constitutionally, we follow the directions of the civilian leaders. And on the ground, there's not a single military member who's being deployed who doesn't want to find some way of, of operating in that space. So many times on the ground, the conversations are, are extremely fruitful, you know, how your point about somebody going into a particular area, that's really helpful for uh, a patrol to know, for a company commander to know, because they, they, they know now what's happening. I, I also think that the dynamic that everyone described about going to your question about security, peacekeeping is, about, is a very complex operation that deals with things like security that 
that are not part of the um, are often not part of the plan for the use of, of the military, and it's very complex. Uh, there, I don't think there's any more courageous person than the person from the NGO, non-governmental organization, who goes into an active conflict area without a weapon, without personal security, to perform their mission in an objective way, applying as best they can all of their uh, tools that they have available. That, that, that is tremendous courage by the organization, tremendous courage by the individual. I don't have to tell you how I feel about our military members who go into harm's way with the specific purpose of bringing all the tools of the U.S. military to bear. That is tremendous personal courage. It's just expressing their moral and ethical frameworks, hopefully in ways that are true to themselves as individuals and, and are operating well in an environment so that they can each be successful. And, and that's our goal. Monica, before, before you give up the floor, you know, you've been involved uh, in the tabletop exercises that, uh, that Carla mentioned at the, at the outset. And I wonder if you could just very briefly uh, pull out one or two of the takeaways from that exercise till now. That might be useful for the audience. Um, some specific examples. Uh, the tabletop exercises have been absolutely critical, uh, and, and the candor with which the civilian agencies and the non governmental agencies have, have um, approached that dialogue have been absolutely critical. Um, Red Cross has been a partner from the very beginning in those exercises. Whether, whether we look at a situation and see it the same way or not is irrelevant. We're able to have the dialogue. Uh, so that now, as a result of these engagements, the Red Cross now engages with our troops before they go forward to, be, to honestly evaluate and, and to give them uh, and to train them. And, and that is part of the dialogue that grew out of this partnership with USIP. Um, another area, uh, Melanie Greenberg part participated in, has participated in almost all of our tabletops, and Melanie's, one of her comments was that you have to think about reintegration from the beginning. Now that sounds awfully logical, but I can tell you that uh, when we went back and said we need to include in each of our operational plans the evaluation of reintegration from the beginning, uh, that was an insight that came about as a result of the work that's being done here at USIP and in the international tabletops. Let me give you one other example. Doctors Without Borders, uh, one of the most um, extraordinary capabilities that collectively we as human beings um, provide. Uh, I can't tell you that our conversations with Doctors Without Borders have always been without conflict. Um, they, they see the best and the worst in, in all of us, um, but it has been hugely helpful. And um, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful to, to USIP for sponsoring the international, the, the interorganizational tabletops and all of the organizations that participate. Excellent. Melanie Greenberg is the president of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, so representing our community from an NGO perspective. So we have just a, just couple minutes left and I just wanted to offer if any of you have any final parting thoughts or anything that just sort of a sum up summation thought that you might want to want to share back to them. So so I if, if we have any members uh, here of the legislative branch staff members um, I, I'd like to make a pitch for continued funding of USIP uh, they have done extraordinary work that has had immediate be benefit uh, to the Department of Defense. Likewise, the Department of Defense cannot be successful unless USAID and the State Department uh, receive the funds that they need in order to be successful. Thank you. Do you have any th final thoughts, Alina? Um, uh, yeah, on a very, I guess, very practical level, I, I would continue to encourage um, you know, USIP and other organizations that bring, the, uh, that provide the space and the opportunity for um, the, the different communities that have to address the, you know, peace building or the conflict areas together to, again, create best practices, publish those best practices, um, ensure that the best practices are not just created at a working level but get to the highest levels of 
of, um, of the decision makers because so much um, it depends, uh, it can shape a strategy or a policy or an approach um, if those good practices. It's, the other point I would say, this is going to take a long time. I think a lot of stovepipes have been broken. A lot of communications across many lines have been um, um, have been bridged and created, and it's a community that they, these are communities that are feeling more comfortable talking to each other. I think you've made that point, and we've made that point on this. Uh, we need to keep doing it um, because I think this, the conflicts on the ground are going to get much more complicated, and they're going to be more costly, and they're going to be more um, civilians that are going to be really the victims of this. And it, it's, it's incumbent on those of us who focus on this and bring resources to the table to get together and make sure we know what we're doing and how we can do it together. Great, Jimmy. We'll have our last word. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> better be a good one. Just to chime in on a, on on Alina's point, uh, in terms of the lessons, let's confess up front: we're all prisoners of our own experiences. Okay, what we really need is a comparative knowledge base, so we can be informed but not trapped by our own experiences. We can understand broadly how peace building strategies can play out in various geographical parts of the world. That's really important for policymakers too. That's point one. Point two, on the funding side, um, we need to uh, work out ways to find support for what I would call um, uh, causally focused funding. Right now, a lot of our funding goes to the symptoms of conflict, humanitarian assistance. You know, we don't use humanitarian assistance to fix tectonic plates when they erupt, right? We feed people, provide food, water, shelter, and, and medicine. Stabilization and peace building, you have to really focus on the deeper causes. And there's just not a lot of funding for that. There's a, there's a particular set aside for Syria, at least in local forms, uh, of destabilization. Uh, and there's, you know, the, the larger thing in wartime setting, SERP and so forth. But, and arguably, that can be a usurping problem. Um, but uh, causal, causally focused funding is really important. And I will leave it at that. That is an excellent final point. Thank you very much. And thank you all too for attending. Appreciate it. And thanks to our panelists.